two, one. Hello everyone, welcome to this very short video on distributed cognition. Uh, in this video, we will be running through some of the key points of the theory of distributed cognition. And the more exciting part of application will be discussed in class with everyone. For the rest of this video, sometimes we will refer to distributed cognition in short form and we'll be using DC for that. Just to give everybody a quick idea of what we'll be covering for this video, we will be talking a little bit about cognition before moving on to sharing the key idea of distributed cognition. And then we will move on to discuss the principles of DC and then also the different facets of the DC approach. So what is cognition? Thank you very much, Xiang Shang, for contributing on Peruso on your take on cognition. So cognition is the process by which people acquire knowledge or apply knowledge or information processing. And the key thing is that it happens within the human brain. And it is an internal mental activities is part of this cognition processes. So in traditional view for cognition, it is always about the individual. So how about distributed cognition? Distributed cognition refers to the distribution of cognition within individuals, between individuals across media, environments, cultures, societies, and over time. So distributed cognition goes beyond the traditional cognitive emphasis on individual cognition, which we have seen just now. And so for the rest of this video, we'll bring everybody through what cognition can be distributed across. And thank you very much, Mina, for contributing to our discussion on Perusa again. So what can cognition be distributed across? It can be distributed across people, artifacts, environment, and even through time. So in the case of a pilot example, within the flight deck and in the cockpit of an airliner, the cognition can be distributed between the three pilots. Over here, you have the pilot, co-pilot, and the first officer. So the cognition processes are actually beyond each of them, and it's the summative of the cognitive processes of each of them and also with their artifacts which are the instruments that they need to be able to read and this information not only uh, the instruments not only give the information but they also form part of the cognitive processes where the pilot will take in information and also be able to decide what to do uh, at different portions of the flight. Beyond that, there is, the condition can also be distributed amongst different pilots in different planes uh, as they encounter different weather conditions at different parts of the world and different traffic conditions. Condition can also be distributed through time when a pilot just starts his training as a first officer all the way until he becomes a training captain. All the events that has happened in his life uh, and the different situations that he has faced will contribute to his cognition as a training captain and allow him to be able to handle different situations in a way that is better or maybe more efficient uh, than a junior pilot. And in the condition, there is no gap between the cognitive process and the external world. All the instruments that the pilots use with the interactions with each other and also the interactions between the different planes, the different pilots in the different planes, all form distributed cognition. Uh, within the cockpit. So in a nutshell, for DC, cognition does not reside only in an individual's mind, but is extended to encompass interactions between people and with resources and materials in the environment across time. Contrary to the traditional view, in the context of DC, there is no gap between the cognitive processes and the external world. So, in the next slides, we will see how this leads us to the principle of DC, where the unit of analysis for cognition extends beyond the individual level and the range of mechanisms that participate in the cognitive processes that are external to the individual. There are three kinds of cognitive distribution as what Daniel has illustrated through the cockpit example, and they include distribution across members of a social group, Coordination between internal and external structure, where the external structure refers to the materials or the environment. And distribution through time, where the nature of later events can be transformed by the products of the earlier events. 
In the next slide, we would like to thank Suwani, who has nicely summed up the applications of the three kinds of distribution through an example on curriculum development. So once again, thank you, Suwani, and everybody for contributing on Caruso. I think it is uh, an example of distributed cognition, and that uh, the group cognition will be greater than the sum of all the parts of individual cognition. That's right. Thanks, Daniel. Now, in the next slide, we will take a look at the DC approach. Firstly, on socially distributed cognition, we understand that cognitive processes involve transmission and transformation of information which reflects some form of cognitive architecture. Now, in the context of a social organization where information flows through a group, the social organization may thus be viewed as a form of cognitive architecture. That is, the ideas or explanations generated by a social group may be used to describe cognition that is happening in their minds. In the next slide, we would like to thank Willin, who has shared her views on how interactions within the social organizations may influence the cognitive behavior. Next, we'll take a look at embodied cognition. In the context of DC, the body and the environment that includes artifacts and other people are considered part of the cognitive process rather than mere stimuli. If you look at the picture on the right, for example, Palette is a tool that allows for cognition to be distributed socially when learners get together and discuss um, their thinking using Palette. And besides that, Palette is also able to represent the group cognition. You saw ChatGPT there. We'll leave you guys to think about whether ChatGPT is also considered part of the cognitive process. Is ChatGPT a mere stimuli or is it a part of the cognitive system? How can it be used as part of the cognitive system? Yeah, we will take that discussion in class. Thank you, Daniel. Then we move on. So from the perspective of DC, the organization of the mind is a property of interaction between the internal and external resources. And what do we mean by this? We would like to thank Jaden, who has kindly differentiated between the two kinds of resources as shown in this slide. Thank you, Aihua, for bringing us through the different types of uh, cognition in DC. Let me continue with culture and cognition. So culture will serve as a base for solutions to be generated and shapes the cognitive processes uh, within us. So different people in different cultures will have co cognitive processes that are structured differently. So when we design cognitive tools or when we think, look at cognitive processes, we should be mindful of the possible blind spots offered to culture. Over here, I would just like to share an example of how uh, people from different cultures can learn about ChatGPT. The image on the left shows if you are going to search for ChatGPT on one of the newest uh, social media platforms uh, called Xiaohongshu, you will see that users can actually post their information about a certain uh, topic, about a certain subject, and you can also see what they actually collect as well. So this is the way in which people who know how to read Chinese uh, will be able to interact with the, the tool and also uh, form part of their cognition in terms of the layout, in terms of the way they use the app. And on the right, if you search for, you want to search for something on IG, you will use hashtags and this is what we are very used to in our culture so and when we search for the hashtags you will you will see what other people have shared and this can form part of social cognition so culture will actually shape a lot of our cognitive, cognitive processes and will definitely be part of uh, distributed cognition so Luosi also contributed her views on culture and cognition. So the beliefs and practices of a culture have a profound subconscious and even unconscious effect on a person. And we do believe that a culture is a very important part of cognition and it is something that we have to take note of uh, when we think of distributed cognition. Yeah, it will help us to identify some of the blind spots or even as we design a tool, uh, be cognizant uh, of the cognitive processes that people from different cultures have. 
Next, we shall talk about uh, cognitive ethnography, uh, which is an approach of distributed cognition as well as research into distributed cognition. So in the article itself, in the paper itself, uh, besides seeking insights on individual minds, researchers also focus on the actions related to cognitive processes and again, and deep understanding by talking to the domain experts. So you will see a uh, Hachin support a Navy ship and this was actually to help him to come up with a lot of the distributed cognitive uh, cognition theories in the paper. So he lived with the domain experts to understand some of the cognitive processes that were not very visible or cannot be imagined by somebody that is actually living on the outside. So that's all we have for now uh, in terms of distributed cognitive theories. And maybe you would like to join uh, Aihua and me on a very fun discussion later uh, on a video, uh, just a fun video later. Yeah. Aihua, you have anything else to say? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for watching this very short video and we will see you in a discussion in class and also in a fun discussion.